let's go on and consider elimination reactions of alkenes with the E1 and E2. So the E1, this is elimination first order, E2 is elimination second order. So when you're talking about the E1 reaction, the rate of this reaction is going to be equal to K multiplied by the concentration of the alkyl halide. Now when you talk of the E2, it will be K multiplied by the concentration of the alkyl halide and the concentration of the base. So for the first order elimination reaction, the first step happens by itself without the base getting to be involved. That's why the concentration of the base is not involved in the rate law expression. So one thing that you need to take note of is, let's start with the E1 reaction. Well, elimination reaction, this has to do with the removal of some compounds from the alkyl halide or whatsoever that we are getting to react with. Starting with the E1, first order elimination reaction, it is a two process reaction. So it involves ionization and deprotonation. Now when you're talking about ionization, what gets to happen? So in ionization, the carbon to hydrogen bond is going to break to give a carbocation intermediate. So we have got a CH bond that breaks and the result of that is a carbocation, something that is positively charged. And then in deprotonation, we are going to now see deprotonation. We get to remove now the what? The proton. That is deprotonation. So we'll see how the process gets to happen when you're talking about this. So typically when you're talking about E1 reactions, E1 reactions get to favor tertiary alkyl allies. And sometimes a few uh, secondary alkyl halides, but for E1 reactions, we will not see them with primary alkyl halides. Unless we're not talking about the tertiary and a bit of secondary alkyl halides. So let's consider an example. Let's say we have got a bromine, which is attached here. Now I'm going to also show the stoichiometry of this one. We have got a methyl, we also have another methyl attached to this carbon and then we have got two, we have got hydrogen over this point. So let's say we have got an hydrogen here, we have got an hydrogen like that and then we have got an hydrogen here. So when you are talking about this E1 reaction, what is going to happen? Now there are different bases that we are able to use to, to make sure that they eliminate the ha halogen. We can talk of sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, we can talk of sodium oxygen. Now instead of having the hydrogen here, we can put the R group, it can be any alkyl group, we, or we can have the potassium like that. This can be any alkyl group. So some of them, they can be back. For example, if the alkyl group is, let's say, an isopropyl or a tetrabutyl, those are bulk uh, groups. And when you're talking about bulk groups, you are going to understand how they get to attack these. Because what you want to do is, you have got a bromine here, you're going to attack behind the bromine because you want to eliminate the bromine. But because we are first discussing E1 reactions, the first thing that happens is that this will happen by itself, this bond between the, uh, the alkane and the bromine will automatically break. So at the end, what we are going to have is, I've got the hydrogen, these three hydrogens. The stoichiometry is still the same at this point. But because you have broken a bond at this point, the stoichiometry will no longer be the same because this carbon is no longer chiro. A chiro carbon is a carbon having four different groups around it. But it is only having three because we have lost one. So we'll not show the stoichiometry. Because we have lost one bond, this carbon is going to come become positively charged. So this is a carbocation that has been formed. From the formation of this carbocation, now we can bring in any base which is able to attack the carbocation. So let's say I use the bulk base from sodium R. Now let's say this R group is uh, an ethyl. So what we are going to have, 
Now, sodium doesn't take part in this reaction, so we're going to have O, which is going to have a minus. Then we have got CH2, CH3, like that. So this is now able to attack, this negative oxygen is now able to attack the positive carbocation. Remember, bromine is a product in this process. And what is going to happen? We are not, we are not just getting to attach this alone. We are also... Okay, let's first get to go with it in this way. So when this thing gets to attach at that point, what you are going to be able to see is that there will be a formation of a double bond. Okay, when this thing gets to... The, the way I've shown this bond is going to be deceptive because it's not supposed to be shown like that. This group will consider where the carbocation is. We are going to go one step away from the carbocation, one carbon away from where this carbocation is. So one of these hydrogens which are here is going to be attacked by the base. So the base comes and attacks this hydrogen. When that happens, this bond is going to now be broken. So what is going to result is we have a formation of a double bond. The stoichiometry is also lost because we only have three, two bonds like that. Of course, we are able to show the stoichiometry when we have got a double bond. And then also this side, we have got a methyl here and a methyl here. So the positive charge has now gone. So this is what we are going to be able to see in this kind of reaction. So what are the products at the end? We have got the bromine as a product. If this one came from the sodium, it means we also have the sodium ion as a pota the product, or if it came from the potassium. So this is the kind of reaction that gets to happen when you're talking about this E1 reaction. Let's consider another one. So just we, we just make sure that we take note that the first step on E1 reaction is that the alkyl halide eliminates the halogen by itself. So this E1, the E1 reaction gets to compete with the SN1 because they've got the same intermediate. For the SN1, we also have the carbocation that is formed. Same with the E1. So if we want to, if these two are competing, we want the E1 to win. What we are going to do is we are going to increase the heat of this reaction. Then... E1 reaction is going to happen instead of SN1. Now, before I get to look at another example, E1 reactions happen mostly with those alkenes or alkenes which are highly substituted. Now, what would be the reason for that? For example, when you are talking about this is an R group, there is an R group, there is an R group, and then you have got your halogen at this point. For E1, the reaction for this one is going to be much faster than when you have got only two R groups and then the halogen. This is also going to be much faster than when you only have one R group. And actually also much faster than when you don't have any R group. So what would be the reason for that? So when you get to consider when you have got a lot of R groups or highly substituted alkyl allies, these we call them bulky alkyl allies because they have got a lot of R groups. So because of that, this gets to limit room for E2 reaction. Actually, E2 reactions are very bad when it comes to more substituted alkenes because the thing is for E2 reactions the base is first going to be able to attack from the opposite direction to eliminate this so if you have got a lot of alkyl groups those are going to be more like an obstruction or a repulsion for the base to be able to attack and be able to eliminate the halogen that is why for E2 reactions they better work with non-substituted alkenes so because it reduces the chance of E2 reactions, then the E1 reactions becomes higher. Another reason as to why E1 reactions prefer bulk, uh, 
or more substituted alkanes is that because they are highly substituted the highly substituted carbocation which are formed are more stable so if you get to eliminate this x the carbocation that is formed from the tertiary carbocation this is very very stable than a secondary carbocation which is more stable than a primary carbocation and the carbo primary is also more stable than a methyl carbocation so those are the two reasons one the bulk one limits room for e2 reactions that is why e1 reactions are better off with bulk or more substituted alkyl allies the second one is because when you're talking about e1 reactions the carbocations which are formed from these more substituted alkanes are more stable okay another thing is when you're talking about e1 reactions bulk bases are better for e1 reactions than they are for e2 reactions so we'll see why it is like that so let's just get to consider one example before we get to talk about also these other things so let's say we have got let's say we've got this compound and you are using an hydroxide as the best to, to be able to attack this so what is going to happen in this reaction so you consider where the bromine is one carbon away from where the halogen is can the hydrogen on those points can be attacked so either at this point you have got two hydrogens or this point where you have got three hydrogens so if we get to attack this hydrogen this bond is going to be broken so this hydrogen attaches to the hydroxide you are going to form water as a product and then what is going to happen is that you are going to have also this result but if this OH attacked this hydrogen what you are going to have as a product this bond would be broken and the, that would form a double bond at this position and on that point when you form that double bond this is going to be broken this bond is going to be broken because this carbon is going to have a lot of bonds so this bond when it is broken it doesn't go and form a double bond here it is always near where the bromine was so the other product that you are able to see now depending with which hydrogen is going to be attacked you are going to have either the cis or the trans isomer so these two products they are called the recessive products this one is called the hoffman product hoffman product results when you attack a carbon a hydrogen which was on a carbon which is a primary carbon a recessive product comes in when you attack an hydrogen that came from a secondary carbon or a tertiary carbon like that so in this case recessive products are always more stable than Hoffman products. And the thing is, when you're talking about this product, because you're attacking a prime, uh, a secondary carbon or a secondary hydrogen, when you form a carbocation, secondary carbocations are always stable than primary carbocation. So you end up this product being more stable than Hoffman products. Now again, the major product is going to be this one, which is a trans, because this our Q groups always want to have maximum distance away from each other. So that is why they are going to make sure that they stay away from each other other than the C. So the C is less stable. So this is going to be the major product in this reaction, which is the recessive product. Let's just consider one more example. Let's say we have got this compound and you are also reacting with with an hydroxide which is uh, it's not a bulk base what would be the product and which one would be the most stable so here is the chlorine so you consider where the those two carbons which are one step away from the carbon containing the chlorine so we have got this one and also this one so in this case you have got hydrogens here those are the ones which are able to be attacked so if this OH attacks this hydrogen, this bond is going to be broken and it goes there. 
when that happens this bond also breaks so what are we going to form we're going to form something like this I've got a double bond here so I'm also going to form a double bond at this point because of this hydrogen that has been broken so if this attacked this hydrogen which is here what would result is that this bond will also be broken and at the end the product that we are going to have is that a double bond is going to be seen here because still this bond is going to be broken so this is going to give us where is the double bond this is going to be at this point actually this one I've put it at a wrong position or maybe it's just my drawing which is wrong on these let me draw that again So we have got a double bond at this point. So we said if we get to attack this hydrogen, the double bond is going to form here. And then for the other one, we have got a double bond. If we attack this hydrogen, the double bond is going to form here. So which one would be more stable? So the most stable is going to be this one. Just like if you consider a benzene ring. The double bonds are alternating. So every time where you have got alternating double bonds, the compound is more stable than when you have got double bonds further apart, like in that case. So that is why this is going to be the major product because it is more stable when you're talking about the conjugated system. So basically this is what we are able to talk about when we're talking about E1 reaction. The first thing is that the bromine is going to be removed and then the base comes to attack so when you're considering now e2 reactions e2 reactions mostly happen for sec uh, primary and secondary alkyl allies so what is going to happen let's say we have got this compound a bromine is at this point what will happen when you get to break this compound in the presence of let's say we use sodium ethanoid like that and then this is of course the sodium doesn't take part in the in the reaction so all we are using is this that is what is getting to work in this kind of reaction so this is in the presence of ethanol because we have got this here okay? So what is going to happen in this reaction? Because this is an E2 reaction, for an E2 reaction, what happens is that first this gets to attack. The, the, your, the base which you have is first going to be able to attack. Now in this case, the base which you are going to have from the sodium, from that compound, the base we are going to have, I'm going to remove the sodium because the sodium doesn't take part in the reaction so we're going to have all bonded to the to that so one is going to carry a negative sign so this gets to attack the carbon which has got a bromine like that actually to not attack basically just this one but you consider one carbon away from the carbon that has got a bromine that is what you consider and what is going to happen in that case it is either this carbon or this carbon or this carbon now you consider the one which is more stable. So this is a primary carbon, this is a primary carbon, this is a secondary carbon. So you consider a secondary carbon. So one of the hydrogens on the secondary carbon is going to be grabbed. When that happens, this double bond is going to be broken and it goes there. So what you are going to have as a product, you are going to have a double bond at this point. So this is what we are going to have. Now this is not supposed to be there. Okay. This is going to be the product which we are going to have. Another thing is we are also able to attack a hydrogen that is at this end. Okay, if we attack this hydrogen at this end, now because we are attacking a primary hydrogen, that is not going to this bond is going to be broken still like that. This can be another product, but this is going to be a minor product because we attacked a primary carbon. 
I mean a primary hydrogen and this is going to be the major product because we attacked a tertiary hydrogen. So what mechanism gets to happen when we're talking about these E2 reactions? Let's say we have got let's say this is the compound that we have we have got an alcohol and you get to react it with OH3 which is a, an acid what is going to happen in this reaction now we can see that in this reaction we, we don't have we don't have the so this is going to be an E1 reaction we don't have the base I mean the halogen is not there okay so the reaction that gets to happen is that this OH gets to attack this point here it is going to grab one hydrogen from the oxygen when that gets to happen what we are going to see is now something like this and now we're going to have OH2 and then plus a water molecule because you have grabbed one oxygen and then this compound that has been formed another reaction continues to happen there is going to be a rearrangement that is going to happen at this point so this bond is now going to be broken by itself the bond gets to break. So when that bond gets to break, what you are going to have is something like this. This is going to remain with a positive charge because you have got few bonds. And when that happens, now you can have another water molecule coming to attack one of the hydro one of the hydrogens away from this hydrogen with a positive charge. So we can either be here or here. Let's say we attack an hydrogen here. Water attacks that. It is going to grab that hydrogen. And so this bond is going to be broken coming here. So what we are going to form. We are going to form a double bond here. And then we have got these two. And then H3O+. plus. So we see we started with H3O+. plus. We have ended also with H3O+. plus. And then we have formed an alkene from an alcohol. So when you have got an alcohol. You get to react it with an acid. You form an alkene with an acid. So this is the this is the decomposition of an alcohol to an alkene. So that is the reaction that gets to happen. Now we said when you're talking about E2 reactions and E1 reactions, they prefer some bases to others. Let's say we have got E1 here and E2 here. What is going to happen? So let me give, let's say if we have got this one with a bromine at this point. And then this one with a bromine at this point. The base that we want to use is O, C, H. Let me say C, CH3, CH3, CH3. What is going to happen? Which one is going to be much faster for these two? For E1 and E2. So if you consider where the bromine is, it is of course attached to a secondary carbon. Now the hydrogens that which are supposed to be attacked in this case are the hydrogens, one carbon from where we are. So for an E1 reaction, the first thing that happens is this will automatically break. So we are going to form this carbocation. Now for an E2 reaction, what happens is that you are able to attack either this one or this one, any one of these hydrogens. But if you consider this, of course the secondary hydrogen is much more stable in forming a carbocation. So it was supposed to be at attacked. But because you have got a bulk base, these other carbons are going to more offer obstruction to the base to be able to attack the secondary hydrogen so this base ends up attacking the primary hydrogen because that is the one which is less obstructed from being attacked so this double bond this bond ends up being broken like that and when it goes there this bond also be broken so what you are going to have as a product in this reaction is is going to be this one but when you consider this reaction which is here 
because you already have a carbocation that has been formed because you've already removed the bromine so you have either at this point or this point one of those hydrogen being attacked since the bromine has already left and this carbocation is very stable this bulk group is able to come and remove any one of these hydrogens so this bond is going to be broken and what are we going to have the product is going to be either this one or it can come and attack this one so another product would be if it attacks that one it would be this one but for this one this is going to be a minor product because this is an Hoffman product and then this is going to be a major product but for an E2 reaction this is going to be the major product because we're not going to be able to see this because we are using a bulk base so a bulk base is better for E1 reactions than E2 reactions so that is also something that you are able to get to note well that is all going to be it for this tutorial thank you so much for watching